Okay, so Carmine. Um let me set this up for the audience because I because I fucking love this. You Preston hits me up and he's like, All right, I figured it out. It's Tyrion's fault we're not getting Winds of Winter. And I'm like, really? Here the entire time I was thinking it was George's asshole problem where he's no longer a starving artist and he can't afford to do whatever the fuck he wants. Fuck his legacy. He's just gonna be as slow as possible. But you're saying it's Tyrion's fault. That's all part of it. But Tyr- Tyrion's definitely like I don't know if Tyrion's a symptom. Uh, of it all but like Tyrion is like Hmm. the forefront I think of I think everything wrong like if you want to look at like what's what going on in George's head what 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 the problem is I think Tyrion at Dance with Dragons is that problem like uh, so just a little background like so um Nearly Done is the first Tyrion like fanfic chapter Um, and so I, um, I've been focusing a lot on Tyrion, been rereading the Tyrion, A Dance with Dragons chapters, um, and thinking about Tyrion a lot and going over it with the editors and, and things like that. And then I, and I realized like, oh my God, I've spent so much time on Tyrion, so much time on nothing, on nothing. Cause the thing about Tyrion's story, it goes nowhere. Right. So it's a lot of like Mm. space. Spending and wasting time making something as clever and playful and poetic as possible because Tyrion chapters are the most poetic and the most clever um, chapters, like language wise. Um, that's a big thing that that only through like you don't realize at the first read, but eventually you start noting noticing that like George. When he writes in different voices, he he for the different characters, he writes very differently. The prose is very different. So like how a Tyrion chapter is written is very different from how a Bran chapter is written. It's very different from how a Victorian chapter is written. It's very different from how an Ario Hota chapter is written. Like what words are used? Like how how poetic the sentence is, the length of the sentence, all of these sorts of things. So Tyrion chapters are the longest sentences, the most poetic language. And then on top of it, Tyrion himself is just constantly, almost annoyingly so, saying something clever every time, every single time. You just can't, you can't just have the, you just can't have the story go. He can't just say something normal to advance something. No, it's got to be something clever and it's got to be dirty and it's got to be, you know, it's just, it's, it's just, it's so much. And so I've heard George in interviews talking about how Tyrion chapters give him a lot of heart, uh, heart, heart burn because he knows that he can go back and like make it even more clever and find even more things for it. And so it's just like a Tyrion mm-hmm. chapter is never done because it can always be more clever, but it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> like the chapter is never done and it doesn't, it doesn't advance the plot at all. And so I, I, I wanted to talk about like going back and I've recently reread Tyrion a dance with dragons and God, it's just such a problem. Like, it's just, it's <laughs> like, I, I, I'm almost like angry at like, cause I, I don't even know. I don't know why it, Maybe it's because I was like writing it and just really hyper focusing on it now and 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 how Tyrion sounds, but it's just, man, what a solid waste of time! Like it was just what a solid fucking waste of time Tyrion is. And I, I mean, does this sound really harsh? No, but at the same time, uh, did, I have to ask: Does this give you a newfound a- appreciate not maybe maybe appreciation is not the word does this give you some like sympathy for dave and dan in later seasons without any book material to cover Tyrion? it, it does when they're it, gives, it gives me sympathy for george too like when i reread Tyrion, i'm like oh my gosh i can tell how much time it took to craft what he's writing i can tell like, oh my gosh, like word for word, like it's beautiful prose. It's just like, he must have taken forever to craft it. And yet it's also like nothing. <laughs> uh, I, I know it sounds really harsh, but it, it does. It does 
give me some sympathy for Dan and Dave. I understand now why they threw it all away. Like the Tyrion story was thrown away in the show. Like there's, it's just not there, right? Um, and Tyrion is 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 done dirty the same way a lot of the other characters are done dirty. After season five, everyone's just kind of waiting for something to happen for mm -hmm. either one of the other big seven main cast members to do something. Usually John or Danny moving the plot forward. Yeah. But yeah, it happened in Brienne, the Hound. Everyone's just kind of waiting for, you know, the ball to drop. But they just, you know, Dan and Dave fast forward through everything. So just, I mean, let's go through Tyrion here for a second and just kind of recap what, um, happens and you'll kind of see what what um what the problem is so Tyrion one it's well generally speaking there's there's just an, a for a background um there's 12 Tyrion chapters in a dance with dragons and they can be broken up into essentially four parts the first three Tyrion chapters are is the is the trip before the Roin. The second three chapters is his adventure on the Shy Maid. The third three chapters is essentially the Volantis and um, um, Stinky Steward uh, ship. And then the last three chapters is him and Marine. And so you, we, we can break those up. It's They, they break up like that pretty easily. Um, in general... Uh, Tyrion is a very large part of A Dance with Dragons. He is uh, about 18% of the text uh, is dedicated to Tyrion um, in mm. A Dance with Dragons. It is a it is a lot of chapters. It is a lot of words. They're not only a lot of chapters, 12 chapters, but it's a lot of words per chapter. And um, when I talk to people about their most favorite and least favorite parts of a dance with dragons people generally dismiss Tyrion as this is a boring travel log then no one i've never heard anyone say it was, the, it was their favorite part of a dance with dragons i know some people that are like oh i liked it it wasn't so bad um and then there's some people that are just like yeah i just you know, you know fast forward it's like it almost it almost plays a break in between a lot of the other breakneck chapters and so, you know, nothing's happening in Tyrion, but a lot is happening in Theon, or a lot is happening in Quentin, or a lot is happening in Victarion, you know, um, or a lot is mm -hmm. happening in Asha, but like nothing's happening in Tyrion. So it's like this, it's like this breathing space between everybody else, everybody else, something's going on in Tyrion, nothing's going on, though not much happens with John or Danny either. So there's other breathing space. So... <laughs> <laughs> So what do you remember of your read, Carmine? Uh, the basics. Um, I didn't realize how it's somewhat, I wouldn't say it's a plot hole, but kind of awkward how at one point Penny tries to kill him for her brother's mm. death. And then yeah. they're just, after a while, they're just cool. Because <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned this in the previous recording we did. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll get to it. It's actually, I think... I think I've I've chosen my least favorite chapter in all of a Ice and Fire, and one of them is is a Tyrion chapter from 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 A Dance with Dragons. And what your what your before we started, yeah. I was I was asking you like what 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 because you were referencing like Tyrion chapter uh, Tyrion seven, and I'm like, is that the one where he's playing Savas? Is you're like, no, that's not it. <laughs> is that the one where John Conrad? No, that's not it. Uh, he's trying to he figure it out. He plays Cyvas in at least three chapters. Um, it might be more. I forget if he, if he, how much he plays Cyvas with Illyrio, but he plays Cyvas at least with Cavo, and he plays with he plays with um, uh, um, Brown Ben at the end, and then he he plays um, a, in Yezin's tent. Oh, I'm sorry. He plays with Yezin's tent. He plays. Oh, he plays with Halden and with with um, Aegon, and then he plays with Cavo, and he plays with Brown Ben and, and the Cell Swords. He plays a lot of fucking Cyvas in, in this in this story <laughs> a lot. So you keep. So you, when you're like, oh, is that the chapter where he's playing Cyvas? Well, no, he's he's playing Cyvas in a lot of the chapters. Like so. Um, I remember him playing it with uh, Fake Aegon, where Fake Aegon gets very upset with him. Yeah, Which that's one, one of the that? better. That's one of the better chapters. I'm gonna say. 
But okay, so so the thing is, is they run together, is what you're saying. Like what happens in each chapter? It's hard to even remember. Like what? It's happens. it's been a minute, but but I remember like like the basic like big things that goes down. Uh, but yeah. you're telling me there's a chapter in there. I also remember that one. A lot of it is what. A lot of it, ironically, is something that we've discussed on the uh, stuff that we discussed on the podcast, like the penny thing that being a little weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cut chapter of Tyrion mm-hmm. supposedly having uh, talking about the um, this one mythical figure that the, I think the, it, was, the, it was the, the Shrouded Lord. Yeah, there it is. It, mm-hmm. You said that George cut out. Yeah, there's a cut chapter. Yeah. Um. Okay, so Tyrion won A Dance with Dragons, um, which is the first chapter of the book after the prologue. And so we're we're thrown back into um, the story with this chapter. And I even vaguely remember reading it my first time and being like, oh my gosh, like, when are we getting anywhere with this? <laughs> um, Tyrion won... It's 6,797 words. This makes it the fourth longest chapter in the book in A Dance with Dragons. It is a long chapter. Um, And in case you don't remember what happens, essentially there's there's three acts in Tyrion 1. First, he's on the ship. And this is about 1,500 words. He's on the ship. And it's a summary of everything that's happened before. And it tries to play a fake out of where he's going to go. So in his head, he's like, oh, am I going to go to Dorne? Or maybe I'm going to go to the wall. I, it's a mystery where I'm going. And, you know, he's summarizing everything that's happened to him in his life, like with with Oberyn and killing his dad and stuff like that. Um, but it goes on. For a long time, it goes on for many, many pages, and and um, and then he arrives at Illyrio's manse, and you meet Illyrio, and for a good, a net, again, a good like three thousand. This is now three thousand words. He, you meet Illyrio, and he starts exploring Illyrio's manse, and he finds some mushrooms, and some poison mushrooms, and he um. He talks to a bed warmer. He talks to a sex worker for a long time. And he's mean to a sex worker because he can tell that she doesn't really like him. And so then he, at first he doesn't want to sleep with her, but then he realizes he hates her. So he's like, I'm going to punish her by sleeping with her. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this takes, this is like, keep in mind, like by the time the ship and exploring the manse and like the, the, the deal with the sex worker happens, we are just like, close to 5,000 words into the, into the paragraph, into the chapter and nothing has fucking happened. Okay. And then he finally sits down and has a, a dinner with Illyrio. And, um, and Illyrio starts talking about, now the thing is that the minute we meet Illyrio, we know what's going on. We're like, Oh, right. Varys works for Illyrio. Varys is probably going to send him to Danny. We kind of knew this from the beginning. So the fake out is kind of stupid. Because as readers, we know like what where Varys would likely want to send Tyrion, but it's especially obvious once he meets Illyrio. Like, oh, you're getting sent to to go see Danny, and so Illyrio starts talking about like where he should go, and he's like, oh, should I go to the Wall with Stannis or should I go down to Dorne with Marcella? That's a bad idea. And then at the end, like it's a long food description, and at the very end. Um, Illyrio says, well, you know, there, there's another leader out there for you, a dragon with three heads. And so we spend like this entire chapter essentially just like rehashing everything. And there's like no real surprise because we know that like Tyrion is going to go to, is, is going to get sent to Danny. The minute he meets Illyrio, that's obvious. And we kind of know this from Varys shipping him off somewhere anyway. But it's just like, it's, it's playing my problem with the chapter one is that it's way too long and that they waste so much time. There's so much time killing, but then also like it's treating Tyrion 
and his him discovering the world as if the audience is discovering the world and the audience is not discovering this the audience knows this so this is my problem the way i see it, it it's like a it's like a recap like the whole mm -hmm. last time on ice and fire like yeah i, I i'm okay with it because at, at one point yeah illyrio you're right illyrio tells him about the like what's going on at the wall and you know marcel and dorn and they're not the right candidates for this game okay yeah so, so i mean it's I fine guess I'm cool as the with first it. chapter of the book post prologue it's acting as a summary of like the previous the previously on like not just for the Tyrion story but for everybody like Stannis is on mm. the wall this is happening in Dorne this is the state of the kingdom kind of stuff like I guess but it's just man it's so long it's so long um so anyway I always felt like this chapter it, it certainly could be combined with with the second chapter which um yeah, this image isn't great, but this is like the second chapter is him and Illyrio in the a carriage on their way to the ruin. Um, and in this, they spend about two. Th this is um, a medium sized chapter, 5,348 words. They spend about 2,000 of those words, like the first, you know, good chunk. Um, talking about Illyrio's motives and like Varys's backstory, which I admit is okay. You know, it's okay. Cause you're like, well, what is, what is Illyrio's motives? But they never really get to it. And he tells a story about Varys and Varys's story is mysterious. So you hear a bunch of stuff, but none of it's, you know, it all could be lies, but you know, then there's like, then there's like this interlude in the middle where Tyrion starts talking about his love for dragons and Garion and his, and and delirian roads and then and then there's a very interesting chunk after that where illyrio starts talking about the golden company um and then it ends with a good like 1500 words or so of like a discussion of andalos and the faith of the seven um along with some like mixtures of like taisha and shay in there but it's a lot of world building as he's like crossing Andalos, but especially because considering they're giving like golden company backstory and you know dragons and stuff like this but um it really felt like they could have combined Tyrion one and two like they didn't need two separate chapters it, it, you know had he been more efficient it wouldn't it would have uh would have been been fine you i i bet you largely don't even remember these two chapters I do. I do remember it. Like I said, it, it felt more like a previously on Ice and mm -hmm. Fire because Tyrion wasn't in Feast for Crows, was he? No, 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 no. Right. So yeah. it's to reintroduce like to the audience, the whole situation. And, and, and that was one of the notes his plot. editor gave him was like, you know, I know this book takes place right immediately after, but it's been it's been many, many years since a storm of swords came out. So it's been a decade since the storm of swords came out. So for a reader who's jumping in, maybe they need a refresher, which is just like, well, when you think about wins, <laughs> like everybody, it's good. It's another decade. Right. So like, will people, <laughs> will they need refreshers in wins? Um, I would love that would be a great meme to continue. Illyrio just appears outside Marine to talk to Tyrion. So Tyrion, just to recap, what happened last time? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There's there's a bit of that actually. It's the one of the, the issues I had like we had with the um with the fanfic was actually like the fact that we're writing Tyrion one and like it doesn't seem like this chapter is needed, and so it is a lot of like summary of what came before. Um. This is probably one of the weirder chapters. Um, Tyrion 3. So Illyrio drops off Tyrion with Duck and Halden. And at this point, we then get an introduction to who Duck and Halden are. And this for the and this is this is a good chunk of time. This is a short chapter, 4,380, but about 3,000 of those words are about Duck and Halden, and it's mostly Duck. We get Duck's backstory, um, which is really weird because although Duck exists for in the background of the of like another few chapters, he's not very 
prevalent. Like Aegon, Halden, um, Septa Lamore, and like John Con come to come to the forefront. And so Duck is just kind of a supporting character in the back. And so it's weird that like so much time, like so much time is dedicated to Duck. <laughs> I, and not even that much to Halden. Like, just so much to Doc. Like, why? Why? You know? Um, and then the latter half of the chapter, like, in a good, good 1,400 words, like, he, he meets John Kahn. And John Kahn's just kind of angry. And I get that, like, there's there's different, um, you know, p- different characters look different from different perspectives. Like, Stannis is very different in Davos chapters as he is in John and, and Sam chapters, and he's very different in, in Asha chapters. So, like, John Khan is just kind of this grumpy, grumpy dude. And that's very different from, like, John Khan from his own perspective. But, um, which makes it interesting considering, that, like, George never planned on having separate John Khan chapters. Um, he, he felt he later needed them. But John Khan would have just come off as, like, a grumpy, a grumpy dude. Um, had he not had his own like POV. Um, do you remember any of this? Do you remember any of the of the duck the duck chapter? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, duck and Halden. He uh, starts uh, testing Duck and Hald- uh, Halden on the the book knowledge. No, 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 no. no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He does test him on the. Um, he does ask him about the the. Uh, the dragons, right? How that is what Halden does the first time he meets him, but Duck, but Duck like just tells the long, like it's mostly about Duck, and he um he tells the long story of like how he uh, how his his sword was taken away by the Lord, and then he got, he he he, um, he got kicked out. Some violence ensued, and things like that. But it's just strange because Duck doesn't play a role later on. And, um, but it's, it's, it's a very odd chapter that so much time is dedicated to introducing these characters. Cause it's not like, it's not like other characters are given this much time. You know, we never get like, take a char- character like Jory. Like Jory is just a character that exists at Winterfell and he's important to everybody. Mm-hmm. But we don't we don't really get time where we get to talk to Jory. And we get a whole backstory about Jory, and like somebody shoots the shit for, with Jory for a whole chapter. Mm. You know, it's, it's kind of the, one of the big differences between like dance and the and the books that came before it. The fact that like an entire like an entire chapter or at least half of a chapter is dedicated to introducing the character of duck. Who's like, not even that important. Do you think that maybe like George had plans for, for Duckfield here originally, like maybe to make him like, uh, young Griff's like sidekick character that would appear all the time, or maybe Tyrion's chaperone, but then decided, nah, I mean, I guess I, I know that Duck, like, you know, is is made a Kingsguard and, you know, there, there there's this implied very important relationship between like Duck and Aegon. But I just don't know, like, when that would be shown, especially when, like, George never planned on having John Con chapters. Like, I don't know when he would when he would develop that. But I mean, I'm happy there are John Con chapters, but it's just really weird that, you know, he decided he he gave all of this backstory to this character that that you know drops off and disappears and he never planned on even having a POV around um it's it's very peculiar like re- rereading Tyrion 3 you're just like why is all of this time given to duck it's just so odd that's that's why that's why I was thinking like maybe duck was supposed to go with Tyrion further into the story but instead of yeah, randomly disappearing. I, I, I think um, that must have been maybe the George case changed it. That that you know, if 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 George thought that he didn't need John Con chapters, he would have thought that like originally that Tyrion would have been able to develop the characters long enough. But then I don't know, he just doesn't happen. Um, 
I mean, I think, you know, going with George's original plan, he, he, you know, Tyrion gets kidnapped, but he could have had that kidnapping happen later after the Lost Lord chapter. So you could have easily had the Lost Lord be from Tyrion's perspective. And then mm -hmm. jumping to Griffin Reborn, you can try to push that into like Arianne, right? So like, it's possible that you could have envisioned a world where there was no John Con POV, but like, but man, you, you still, but I don't know. You still, I still don't see any duck. It's just so weird. <laughs> oh, anyway, again, not, a, not too memorable of the chapter. Um, but here we go. This is where people, I think when people start talking about the, the, the Tyrion story, the shy maid is when I think it starts hitting its groove. And so here he gets on the shy maid, medium sized chapter, and we're introduced to Septa Lamore for a good period of time. And then we get into young Griff's education um, and Volantis's backstory. He said the, the education is on like history. So they start talking about Volantis. And then when does, get... uh, when does Septa, Lam uh, Septa Lamore appear? Is, th is this it? Yeah, this is it. This is where she's introduced, really, or in detail. Where, where uh, th this is this is the the chapter everyone gets that she might be a Shara Dane because she looks like she's uh, has given birth before. Yeah, with the stretch she's marks. Given birth. She's around the like, she's around the right age. She's like <clears throat> he, he describes her as a handsome woman, but still you know still attractive. But you know so, so you know something something like something like in her late thirties or early forties. Um, is, is the idea but there's i mean there's a lot of time wasting but it's like a lot of atmosphere um you know like stealing biscuits and stuff and eating eating food descriptions so one of the things that i also think think that um destroys the Tyrion chapters is that normally you know when you're in a new destination you want to at least give some setting but Tyrion's in a new destination like every chapter so there's just all this time wasted on setting. And so it's just setting. And then this is your new setting. And this is your new setting. And this is your new setting. And let's waste a lot of pages describing what it looks like. Um, and so, you know, this is, what, this is what happens. Like Tyrion 1, he's talking about the manse. And then they're talking about the hills of, the hills of Andalos. And then, you know, then we get on the, the river and he's talking about life on the river and you know, you can visualize it. It's all very beautifully written, but the story's not getting anywhere. This isn't advancing the story. Um, I'm just like getting pretty descriptions of hills and rivers, you know. Um, and it mm. doesn't affect Tyrion. It's not like Tyrion becomes like he sees nature and he sees how world diverse and cool the world is and he changes because he doesn't. You know, it's just like it's just it's just setting for the sake of setting. But nonetheless, I think people like they like this Tyrion part and really I think had they, you know, if had George taken Tyrion one through, one through three and made it one chapter and then jumped into him being on the shy maid uh, and focused on that, it would have been more interesting, especially with the characters um, that he's at, that he's with uh, more time with John Con and Aegon and, and, and Halden and, and Septa Lamor, you know? So, then we move on to probably, I would say, the best chapter of um, of the story. Uh, Medium-sized chapter, a little, maybe a little, little on the short side. Tyrion five, and this is of course Tyrion in Crowain fighting the Stone Men, and this is a pretty, pretty exciting and important chapter. Very interesting. He also reveals, you know, you get the Aegon reveal. Um, but this is, this is, you know, some action, some action actually happens. So I think people very much remember this chapter. Um, does this one stick out for you? Yeah, this is the one where, yeah, he, uh, he gets dragged down by the, by the, uh, the, the stone men and uh, yeah, basically what you said, this is the one that sticks out for me. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, like what you describe of like what you remember from the previous chapters and you're like, oh, right. Heldon, Heldon quizzes Tyrion once on some knowledge and you're like okay like 
<laughs> it's about all you remember from the first four chapters is like Septa Lamore being naked and Halden quizzing <laughs> Tyrion on some knowledge. <laughs> Don't question it. It's it's been years. It's been years, and, no, but, but and this, over but this time, is, like yeah, I think it's telling though, right? It's telling about like what is salient and what like sticks out. Um, so this is a big chapter, you know, where you, you get the you get the little warp, perhaps a time warp, who knows? But the two bridges, um, the stone men, him revealing Aegon, him falling into the water. This is this is probably a pretty. This is probably you know the best chapter of the of the whole of the whole bunch just because it's also you know it's creepy on top of it you know and then we get to um Tyrion six <sighs> Tyrion six is they arrive in sell Horace and um he well first he plays Sivas with Aegon and Aegon he convinces Aegon to go west instead of east. And it's a it's a pretty clever little scene. I think the tricking Aegon scene is very, very well well done. Um because he's he's telling him a strategy, and then the actual strategy on the board is the exact opposite. And it's what Aegon should be doing is the actual side S game they're playing, but he's telling him words wise to do the exact opposite of what he's doing on on the on and on the board it's it's very cleverly written um i like it a lot do you know what i'm talking about uh yeah but i'm i'm also surprised that you didn't mention the whole uh you're not mentioning the whole the, the time when uh uh aegon he's talking to aegon about what's going on with westeros about how instead of going east they should land in dorne and take care and take advantage of all the problems and stuff like that yeah that's what i'm saying that's the cyvas game so, so what George okay. does, what George does, it's very clever. So Tyrion and Aegon are playing Sybass and he tells Aegon that, you know what? If you go east to Daenerys, she's going to see you as a beggar. And what's smarter is if you go west, establish yourself. And then when she comes to you, you'll be on equal footing. And, and he tells him like, also don't trust anybody. Everybody's a liar. And then meanwhile, in the game they're playing, he defeats Aegon and his lesson is keep your dragon close. And of course, so the, the Sivas game is the good advice and, Aegon, and Tyrion is purposely telling him bad advice. In fact, later in the story, he's like, oh, Tyrion, uh, the boy fell for it. it was that, that, you know, so it, it's very cleverly written where where if you're if you're paying attention to what they're playing, how they're playing Sivas, the the real true lesson is there. Keep your dragons close. And Tyrion is lying to him and telling him the exact opposite and convinces him to go west. Um it's very it's it's a very well done chapter. And 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 this is why I do think that like the shy made part of Tyrion is the best part. Like the first three chapters were a waste of fucking time. And then the, the, the second three chapters is really Tyrion hitting his stride. You know, you get, you get really important characters, great characters that are introduced. You get the exciting stone men situation. And then you get this really clever, like tricking Aegon situation, like really important events that all happen um, that, that, are, that are quite well written, you know. Is this the chapter that ends with him in the brothel and yes. him being just a piece of shit in the brothel and then yes. ultimately getting taken yes. by by Jorah? Okay. Yeah, it's 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 he then after the tricking of Aegon, he then goes and and goes play Sivas with Kavo, who is the um he's the uh the the customs official and he gets more history about Volantis. Oh my God! There's so much fucking. By the way, there's so much fucking Volantis <laughs> history in in all of this in, in all of this that goes nowhere. Like it's not it's not that important. Like Volantis' history is not that. Like this is all leading up to the fact that like Volantis is going to have an election, and after the election, they're going to support Danny, or they're going to want war against Danny. But then that war is going to get flipped because of the because of the the slave soldiers or something, you know? And like mm. you didn't need this incredibly complicated situation. You didn't need to like be telling us about all the different candidates and 
and and the tiger faction, the elephant faction, all of this like it, it wasn't necessary, but for for you know essentially they're, they're going to go to war with Daenerys, which they should be doing because they're slavers, and then have their 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 soldiers like you know be red red god zealots you know it's, it, it doesn't take that much but so much time is on volantis history like you've you've got you've got like one like illyrio talks about volantis and then the lesson with aegon they talk about volantis and then there's this ship this the ship heads up called the kingfisher and they talk about volantis and then we get to cabo and he talks to about volantis and then we get to the fucking volantis chapter and oh my god it's just so much on Volantis. Um, <laughs> for no the, it's the, just... these chapters, these chapters are one of the reasons why the fandom loves to say how George is more more interested in in filling out his world rather than finishing mm. the story. And I don't blame them, but yeah, at the same time, that, that that's what that's always been a thing. Like Brienne walking through the Riverlands and all this other crap and all these houses. We've always kind of yeah, had stuff like this a bit. Um. So yeah, he does go to the brothel and he treats the sex worker there like shit, which he already did that. Like he already treated another sex worker like shit. Like one of them could have been cut. He doesn't need to do it twice. You know, like, but nonetheless, he goes to the, like the first sex worker at Illyrio's Mance was not necessary because he's already doing that, being shitty to a sex worker like later. And then just... The weird sheer coincidence, the contrivance that that in the entire world, um, Jorah would be in the same brothel. <laughs> like, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, I granted, like, he runs into Catalan at the end, at, at the end of the crossroads, but th- it's the end of the crossroads. You're supposed to, like, everybody's supposed to meet there, and perhaps there, were, perhaps there was actually a scheme for them to meet. But, like, why would... Why would Jorah be in the middle of Silhoris? Like it's just, it's just, it's such a contrivance. Oh, this is where this is where this is where it starts getting bad. <laughs> like I say, I think the the set like part two, as I say, it was like four parts to to Tyrion. So so like chapters chapters four through six are like the highlight, the highlight of Tyrion, and then chapters. Seven through nine are just, it's just where everything like fucking falls apart. So Tyrion seven is my least favorite chapter in all of Ice and Fire. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's the one where they, um, they, so, so Jorah takes him to, uh, the woman on the, the waterfront. The widow on the waterfront. Yeah. And this is, is this where Penny meets, uh, joins up with them, joins the party? Well, she attacks them. And then she's like part of the she she's part of the party after that. Okay, really, you didn't like this one? I hate it. I hate this chapter so much. <laughs> it's so beautifully written. It's so beautifully written, and it is such such useless trash. Like it's just like it goes. So this chapter is nine thousand four hundred and one words. Okay. Hmm. This this is the third longest chapter in Ice and Fire. Okay, the first the first longest is is, is um Elaine to a feast for crow, crows where she's coming down the mountain with Sweet Robin, which is a brilliant chapter because Miranda Royce is wonderful in that, and the second longest chapter is Crescent's prologue in A Clash of Kings. So, both of those chapters being super long, I don't mind it because those are both incredible chapters. There is no reason this chapter needs to be nine thousand four hundred fucking words. There's none. It is what what's the chapter that comes before this? The the one where they're in Cell Horus. It's a long No no no. One what's too. the chapter what's the chapter that comes before this in like chronological order? Like who who came before this? Is was it a John chapter? Oh. Let me see about that. Um Uh, the Wayward Bride. Ooh, I, is that the one where uh, they're attacked in the in the, in the yeah. forest by the by the Northmen? Well, I actually chapter. like that one. Yeah, pretty. Exciting it chapter. is. So, so we 
and, and, and you like that one too, right? Yeah, I, that one is one of my favorites. The Asha, Asha story, Asha's story in the Dance with Dragons is fucking gold. It's fucking gold. All, so, all so three, we go from all three a, chapters a, are, are gold. Yeah. So we go from a phenomenal Asha chapter to mm. a, a very, in your opinion, boring Tyrion chapter. Uh, I mean, I would just say the worst. This is the worst. Okay. 9,402 words. The first <laughs> 3,500 words is a description of them walking through Volantis. They walk through Volantis for the length of like an, an entire, like what should be the length of an entire chapter. And then another 2,000 words after that is like Tyrion spending the night in Jorah's room. Like, it's just the descriptions of like the water, them going across the bridge, like slaves, how things work, like the merchant's house, him being in a room, the length of his chain, if there's a window and he can jump out of it, like Jorah's hair. Like, it just goes on and on and on and on. It is the worst. It is the worst. I mean, it's beautifully written. It is the worst fucking chapter. It's just like Tyrion the is Jorah's t- prisoner. So George wants to make us feel like we're t- a Jorah's prisoner too. I guess, but I'm just like, oh my God, this must have taken him forever. It's, it's just like, it must have taken him forever. And it is so superfluous. And then after that, we get to the widow on the waterfront which is a long, long conversation. What, what on the waterfront ordeal is very, very long. It's like a third of the chapter, but like, um, we get her backstory. Who fucking cares? <laughs> like, it's like we get this long fucking backstory on this character whose main function is to give them a ship. <laughs> like, that's it. Like, we, um, and then it doesn't even like, and the whole, like, it doesn't even make sense. Like their whole ordeal with her, like they get attacked by Penny. And then for some reason, after trying to murdering, after, after nearly murdering a dude, they like Penny is like given food and cleaned up. And then Tyrion lets her on the ship with them, even though she tried to murder him. <laughs> like, and like the widow on the waterfront, like doesn't trust Jorah. But then after Penny attacks Tyrion, she suddenly trusts Jorah. It doesn't make the, it's, it's, it's the weirdest <laughs> fucking 180, you know, that makes me think that like, is George thinking that there's some sort of conspiracy? Like, like what, how, why did she do this? It's just, but, but even if there were a conspiracy for, like, why the Widow of the Waterfront really let them do that, why would the characters fall for it? Wouldn't they be like, this is fishy. <laughs> why did she suddenly change her mind? That was weird. You know, like, none of it makes sense. Like, it's just the most illogical shift where all of a sudden the Widow of the Waterfront wants to send them and um, Penny, like, Tyrion wants to bring Penny along for no fucking reason. It's really fucking weird. It's a really fucking weird chapter. <laughs> it's the worst. It's the worst. Worst chapter in A Dance with Dragons. A worst chapter in Ice and Fire. I can't think of a worse chapter. Tyrion fucking seven. <laughs> you need to go back and read this shit, man. I, I, I feel I, I really I really should, because I really don't think it's as bad as you make it out to be. Oh but, my god! Mm. Just you'll just be reading and just be like, "Oh my god, this is just going, and going, and going, and go." I mean, and keep in mind, like, oh, it's beautiful, but here, like, um, let me try to like compared to some of Brienne and Arya chapters. Like I, I really don't think this is as, was that bad. But then again, it's been over ten years, so I should go back. Having gone back, I mean, I understand that people think that about Brienne, but having gone back through Brienne, I realize Brienne's story is very tight. But um, okay, let's see here. Here is a dance with dragons. The the Tyrion Seven. 
And it's just like, <sighs> you can see how it's just all so beautiful. By the time they reached Volantis, the sky was purple to the west and black to the east, and the stars were coming out. The same stars in Westeros, Tyrion reflected. He might have taken comfort had he not, um, if he had not been trussed up like a goose and lashed to, to a saddle. He'd given up squirming. The knots were bound to him were too tight. Volantis closed its gates at dark, da-da-da, his cat, and then the city walls, they rode past guild halls, markets, bathhouses. The war horse with padded south, war horse padded south across the river. Shops grew smaller and meaner. The streets, the, the trees along the streets became a row of stumps. Cobblestones gave way to devil graphs beneath their horses' hooves, and then to the soft, wet mud, the color of a baby's night soil. The little bridges that span the small streams, and then it just goes. The fucking <laughs> old Volantis, first daughter of Valyria. The oh, proud Volantis. And then there is the smell. It hung in the hot, humid air. Rich, rank, per pervasive. And there's fish in it, and flowers, and some elephant dung, too. Farther south, the signs of prosperity began to reappear. Abandoned buildings were seen less often. Oh my god, it just fucking goes. Oh, Volantis was overrun with white dwarf elephants as they drew closer. Oh my god. Three <laughs> they get They eventually get to Bonero, which is a little interesting. But then it's just like... Ah, forces wave back to the plaza, ignoring the curses that were flung. What? And they came upon a stable. The the knight dismounted, then hammered on the door of a haggard slave. They're like every single moment, like I've Jorah getting off the horse, him knocking on doors. Like nothing can just be like they got to the inn. Like you know, it can't just be like the next morning. No, it was like every fucking moment of their trip in Volantis. The manacles were black iron, thick and heavy. Oh, please describe more of this environment. It just goes on and on and on. The rest was <laughs> Tyrion's clanking and clattering. Volantis traveled the mouth of the Rhoyne, of where the river was kissed by the sea in two halves. So your problem the here. Bridge. Like, oh my God, it just, like, I'm just going pages and fucking pages. <laughs> so, so your problem here is that a lot of it seems like filler. It seems like filler, basically. It's all fucking filler. Oh my god. Well, wasn't this originally supposed to be paired with Jamie and Cersei's stuff and Feast? And then he, he was forced to split it in two <sighs> books? It's hard to know. It's hard to know how far along he was. You know? Um, when this was all done? Um, anyway. Like I say, this logical turn... And then we get to Tyrion 8, which is a kind of nothing chapter. He's just on the the Silsori Quran and like he gets like he and Jorah get into a fight and he and Penny get into a fight. And like, you know, that kind of that you're introduced to Makoro. Um, oh, I was it, about to ask you, like, when 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 does he actually talk to Makoro? This is it. He talks to Makoro here. He talks to Makoro. So both eight and nine take place on the on the ship, um, but people conflate and confuse the two because they're both on the ship. But essentially, Tyrion nine is the one with the storm and the jousting, and Tyrion eight is the one without the jousting or the storm. <laughs> Like, it's just, you know, like, the eight is kind of the more boring version. Like, it's the one you could probably skip. Unless you're, like, seeking out the Makoro visions and what Makoro is talking about. But it, it doesn't really, they don't really explain, like, why Tyrion wanted Penny to come along. You know, he's just like, oh, well, we couldn't leave her in Volantis. Why? She tried to murder you. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> So, Tyrion Nine, yes, the, the the jousting, and then there's the storm, and Makoro, Makoro gets gets tossed off, and and then the, then they're they're captured by slavers at the end. It's the more exciting chapter. Um, really, I don't think they needed eight; they could have blended the two, had all the excitement with nine. Um, I don't even know if they needed fucking seven. The thing is, like, once Jorah had captured Tyrion, his next chapter could have been on the ship. You know? Tyrion had got him, and then they were on the ship. Like, it could have just been that. 
they play this big surprise as well. Like Tyrion's like, oh my gosh, we're going east instead of west. Ha! Huh? There's this big discovery for him. But the minute it's Jorah, we know that they're going to go east. So again, it's like not, it's not a surprise for the audience. It's like surprises for Tyrion, you know? So that's the, that's my problem with that. Um, So anyway, I really didn't like the first three chapters. I liked the second three chapters. I really, really didn't like the next three chapters. And then things start getting better again as they make it to Marine. Uh, Tyrion 10 is the auction. Um, this is pretty memorable. I'm sure, I'm sure this one you kind of remember like him, him like. Is this the one with the, the introduction of Brown Ben Plum? Um, Brown Ben Plum is at the auction and he, he does play Sivest later um with with Tyrion but like it, this chapter is mainly like him like on stage being vulgar and then trying to get his price up uh and then he you know he gets bought by Yezin so it's a lot there's a lot of humor to it in this one mm. the auction and then and then he gets taken back to Yezin's tent and he's um and he's he's playing Sivas with them and he, he he meets like the 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 tattered prince and, and brown ben plum and things like that so it's a little more exciting um, which is nice because you know George George wrote these ones later, so you know they're 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 good. It's good that George, you know, George wrote them later. What do you mean? Well, they're near the end of the they're near the end of the story, and we know that like with the mirror, oh, okay. not George rewrote a lot of these chapters over and over again, and like worked on them for a while. So I think mm. this is why there's like some improvement. Um. So the auction and the games are Tyrion 10. And then Tyrion 11 is his escape. And it's it's a lot of description of like the camp and the war. But this is where he gets like the water pails. And he like, uh, Yezin is dying of the pale mare. And he his, he's killed nurse. He kills nurse with the, with the mushrooms. This long payoff of the mushrooms that he found in the first chapter that he keeps mentioning throughout the story. He finally uses them on nurse, which, you know, okay. Um, he didn't, I guess, you know, and then he, he, he sneaks over to the second son's camp with Jorah and, and, and Penny. And, um, so this is, you know, fairly, fairly exciting of him just describing the, the entire environment there. And then the final chapter, which, is a bit of filler is Tyrion 12. And then this is him signing all of the notes, promising the second sons, all of his money. And it's like him. It's a lot of description of like the paper and the ink and how much, how much is going to each person and, and, and like getting introduced to the second sons. This, this, you don't remember at all. <laughs> The only the, the only reason I remember is because you made a whole th a whole big deal about Tyrion actually trying to introduce paper money uh, in the previous podcast. And uh, no, I'm going to be very and real with I you. Tyrion it was just is filler. Now I was just like that, that was a bunch of random <laughs> shit. It had nothing to do with paper money. I'm reading into it. I'm I'm thinking that it was just like filling pages. The only thing I remember about the later Tyrion stuff is like they're getting to towards marine and everyone's preparing for everything and it's setting up a lot of the guys outside of marine who are either laying siege or supposedly joining danny's forces and uh him promising a lot of stuff and that's about it uh jorah getting ready for battle i guess and that's about it it's been a minute yeah am i right on all that yeah yeah i mean jorah's just depressed at this point after he gets sold <laughs> into everybody? slavery he goes he, he becomes super depressed um penny is just kind of annoying in the background and then uh <laughs> you know poor um, penny but uh i mean at least at least when they get to marine the characters are very colorful um you know you've got you've got sweets and nurse and all these kind of crazy yezin a lot of a lot of crazy extreme characters um, is sweets the um the tr i remember there being a trans character i don't remember if that was sweets or or um Yes, yeah, sweets is or um, the person in uh, the person in and and young Griff's company whose name. Yeah, I, some, uh, someone forget. recently told me that uh, she the um, 
He's he's not trans, but they're uh, uh, um, apparently you're you're not supposed to use the word hermaphrodite anymore. So I'm going to uh, um, intersex. Yes, there it is. Intersex. There's an intersex character, uh, which is sweets. Yes. Who's the trans character in in um in in Fake A Guns group? I forgot his name, but I believe he's in he's the Master of Whispers. Fuck, Lysan Omar. There you go. Mm. Lysan Omar is a trans character as well, right? I'm not. Well, I'm well, not imagining know, we're, that. We're not sure if he's if he's trans or he just cross dresses or whatever, um, or he's just you know gender fluid or whatever. It's hard hard to say. Right. And and certainly when George Rick wrote the character and envisioned the character, it was in a different environment than now. Because like I say, now it's like, you know, a completely heterosexual dude can just wear a dress. And that's just like something people do now. But like, you know, gender and sex, uh, you know, were, some, were something different, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and especially like George's mindset, like he's a hippie from the 70s, you know, like <laughs> from the 60s and 70s. So it, it's hard to say like what, you know, how he's interpreting it. It's funny that like the world has changed so much since George started writing that uh, like things change meaning, you know, like the Brienne story has a lot of things to say about sex and gender, but like sex and gender are very united in that, in his exploration and we wouldn't we wouldn't make those distinctions like you know today you know in, mm-hmm. in the same way um we describe them differently but you know the world the world changes and uh you know. it, it, it's it's so weird hearing you like go into somewhat detail about what happened in all of Tyrion dance of dragons because it's like i said it's been what 11 years 12 mm-hmm. years maybe since i went into it and i do remember the major story beats like the stone men penny Jora, the brothel, Septa Lamour, stuff like that. You know, Young Rift, of course. But <laughs> you, remember the, I, important, you remember the important story beats, right? But as we go on, like the later, the the later three, four chapters, that gets a bit more fuzzy because I, I think I started clocking out because it it really is just about like you know Tyrion just. Nah, it's just I I think time, the issue times. was. George feels like Tyrion is the main char- like main character of the story. And if he's not the main character, he's one of the three, the, the major three. You know, Johnny, Danny, Tyrion, right? And with all three characters in A Dance with Dragons, you feel like they're killing time. And it's it's I would say it's less so with John and Danny. Like I think first read people get that impression with John and Danny. I think there's more going on with John and Danny at closer read. Like everything that happens in John's chapters builds to something. It's all in the background. You know, you, you him arguing about food, you know, in the, in, in whatever, like doesn't seem very important at the time, but it leads to something, you know? Um, or Danny, like, the various things happening in the background with regards to like the, the the sons of the harpy and the green grace and things like this, like it does lead somewhere. That's still, you know, all those things, all those plot threads do like go through, but with Tyrion, it's just, it's just a lot of like descriptions of setting and him just like fumbling through and describing the setting. And that's it. Um, and for the most part, it's things that happen to him, like very mm-hmm. little. He does not. He doesn't have very much agency himself in the story. Um, you know, he is he is taken by Varys and given to Illyrio, and he's taken by Illyrio and given to John Con, and he's taken by John Con down the river, and he's taken by Jorah onto a ship, and then he's taken by slavers to Slavers Bay. <laughs> you know, and then only when he like breaks away from Yezin does he like have a, a little bit of agency where he like leads, leaves, and like goes to the second sons. Um, I mean, Whatever. he does some, he what, does what has some weird Tyrion, stuff. Yeah, 
But when has he ever gone on his own and done his own thing? Besides the first couple of chapters of A Game of Thrones where he goes to the wall briefly, right? Like, as soon as he comes back into the crossroads, he's there, and then he gets taken by Catelyn. And then for the most most of that, he's forced to be with his father in at the camps. And then get in, in Clash of Kings, he's mostly in King's Landing, and he has to be there. He can't just run off and do his own thing. He has to right, but he either, has, which he, he likes least, doing. He has at least hand, like, making decisions and stuff. Right, which he enjoys doing, but then Storm of Swords, some of that is him, you know, being charged for murder. And then Feast for Crows, he sits out. And when when does he really ever get the chance to do his own thing besides the first couple chapters of Game of Thrones and most yeah. of Clash? I mean, I guess I guess that's a fair point. That's a fair point that in reality like it's like Jamie's stuff. Jamie only only ever shines when he's not in King's Landing or next to Cersei and Tyrion. Like all his stuff that's super interesting is when he's never yeah. like following the status quo. That's some interesting stuff about who has the most agency in the story. Cause really when you start thinking about like big decisions, like Catelyn makes some really big decisions on her own that really affect the story. Tyrion and you know, Tyrion tricking Aegon has a big effect on the story. Um, and Tyrion being a dumbass and giving John Con grayscale is is a, is a is also like a big like you know a big part of the story. But um, yeah, you know it's strange that you know he doesn't really have that much control over his own destiny. Uh but yeah, it's just it's it. Going reading it re- reading it again recently, the just the impression that I got was this is twelve chapters. It could have been done in six. Like it could have been done in half the time. And there was just there was just it was just not necessary. It was not necessary. But I think George felt this is the main character. I need to have chapters that have Tyrion. And Tyrion needs to have page space. And um and thus he was given page space. And a lot of nothing. A lot of nothing. <laughs> oh my What's god. What's that chapter you said you hated? That was Tyrion six? Tyrion seven. Tyrion seven? Alright, let me Tyrion write this seven. down so I can <laughs> I I because I, I swear it's not as bad as you make it out to be, but maybe I'm wrong. Hold on, let me go back and read Tyrion. I'm gonna read that tonight. I'll read it again tonight. Hold on. Tyrion seven. Let me just type it down here. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, like I say, it's beautiful. Like the prose is beautiful and it's, it's the worst. It's just the fucking worst. Fucking. Well, you did, um, you did message me and you're like, you said, um, why Tyrannus is keeping us from ever getting wins. So why is Tyrion keeping us from getting wins? Well, the, the thing is, I really think that like, as George feels like he needs to give Tyrion space, he's going back and he's just filling in with like beautiful prose and clever things that Tyrion's saying. And that takes forever. That takes for fucking ever to go in and like craft all that. Oh, what, how can we make Tyrion even say something even quippier? Well, this line, this needs, this needs to be even snappier. And this line, this poetry of this environment needs to be even more beautiful because Tyrion's so smart, you know? And so he's constantly going back and like writing more and 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 making it more complicated when really like just cut Tyrion out like Tyrion Tyrion must be the hardest chapters to write it's very clear that they're the that they're they're the most beautiful the most poetic with the with the snappiest cleverest dialogue it is and it needs to stop <laughs> like it needs to stop <laughs> We all we all have that though, where we put something out. As content creators, you know this very well. You put mm-hmm. something out, and then as you're listening back to it, you're like, "Damn, I could have included this. That would have been so cool, oh, yeah, yeah, or so yeah. much oh, more cool." Absolutely. But yeah, it's just shouldn't have made him so smart. Shouldn't have made us like you don't need to have everything be so beautiful and long, and give him make him the main character, and give so much time to him. Just like move like it's just not necessary it's just not necessary we didn't need Tyrion. but that's we didn't how Tyrion. 12, we didn't need 12 chapters. uh i 
I would probably agree with you that we probably didn't need 12 chapters, but him being so clever, that's how he moves the story along. I mean, he's a little guy. What can he really do to really move it along? He can't really walk anywhere without being, you know, a hazard to himself because he's a little guy and he's a Lannister and, you know, he's just a target all the time, poor Tyrion. So I kind of see why, but at the same time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you for uh, sitting with me uh, as, I, as I got this off my chest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, man, um, thank you. And uh, well, I guess we'll see you guys uh, next time.